All right, let's see if we're going. Thanks for being here, everyone. Trying to see if we're coming up on the YouTubes. Hello there, and welcome to another live stream. In this one, we're just doing some uh, Q&A. So if you're here live and you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the chat, and uh, we'll do some questions. Let me close a few things, because it looks like our YouTubes are actually working. We're showing up here. So hello, and thanks for being here. Let's get right into some questions, some stuff that uh, came through on the Instagram. So first we have Izzy saying, First year comp study tips, question mark, exclamation point. I believe that emoji was, um, a lot of people use it as like a praying emoji. I believe the original context of this was it was two people doing a high five. So first year comp study tips, question mark, exclamation point, high five. Will this be recorded to watch later, question mark. Have class at 10, rolling silly face. Uh, yes, this, this will be... Uh, you YouTube live streams, you, they're automatically recorded and you can watch them later. People call that the replay. So, yes, all of these are available later. Uh, first year comp study tips. So this is kind of a broad thing. So basically, uh, I know a lot of people are studying for year ends. They're studying for comps. And so if you're doing herbs, I actually made a little email review course. I put a link to that in the description below. But if you're studying for your first year end herbs. There is a, a little email course that you can sign up for and it's basically like a week of emails that uh, point you to different resources on the website and on the YouTube channel that you might not know about because they're kind of spread all over the place. So if you're doing herbs, that's something you can look at too. But in terms of general study tips for uh, year ends, it's kind of like I, I have a video called like six study tips for acupuncturists or something like that if you look it up. And it just kind of gives some study advice. And it's kind of the same for year ends. I think a lot of the advice I would give would be the same, which is stuff like uh, make sure you're, you're studying regularly, that this isn't a, a cram the night before type of thing. Uh, sometimes I would, I would think of it like, suppose you were doing yoga and you were learning downward dog. It's not like you would go spend one night doing downward dog for three hours and then not do it again for two weeks. The way you would learn this is you would do it a little bit every day. Just maybe spend a couple minutes doing downward dog every day. And when you first start doing it, you're going to be kind of crappy at it. It's not going to look very good. It's going to be difficult. But if you do it a little bit every day, you're, it's going to become easier. You're going to, it's going to start looking and feeling better. It's going to be more comfortable. And you'll be able to get deeper into the subtleties of it. And so I think the same thing, If wh whether you're studying points or herbs, it's that, think of it as that same kind of like, you're not memorizing information you're working on a skill. And so that's something that you should practice a little bit every day. And if you do that, you'll become more comfortable with it. So it's not like uh, I'm gonna cram all the point locations in one night and then I studied point location. It's kind of like every day you should be going through and being like, oh, lung one, six soon lateral to the midline, lung two, six soon lateral below the clavicle, stuff like that. Or with your herbs, you should be going through your herbs on a regular basis trying to slowly build up that skill the way you would if you were doing yoga or lifting weights or getting into shape or something like that. So, th so that's one thing is when you study, try to study regularly and try to think of it that way, not just if you cram the night before, you're going to forget it and the next day and what's the point. Another thing I, I like to emphasize is remember that there's a difference between recognition and recollection, that a lot of people when they study, they flip through their notes and they're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh yeah, I remember that. Or they have their flashcards, it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they think that they know the information, but really they look at their note card and they recognize the information. And that's not the same as being able to recollect the information when you get to the test. So if you're doing that, flipping through your notes, being like, Oh yeah, Ma Huang releases the exterior. It's good for coughing and wheezing. You have to be able to close your notes, put down your notes cards, and can you still say Ma Huang ephedra herba uh, promotes swelling to release the exterior for Taiyang excess. Good for coughing and wheezing. Promotes urination to treat edema. Zitsu Ye uh, 
uh, mildly releases the exterior, but also harmonizes the middle jowl. It enters the spleen and stomach channels. It's aromatic, things like that. Can you actually uh, close down your notes and still know the information? And then, I don't know. Uh, I guess uh, another one is uh, I like to tell people, make sure you're studying the way that you're tested. And so if you have like practical stuff, you should probably study in a practical way. If you have a points location test where you need to locate 10 points in 10 minutes, you should probably practice actually locating the points. Maybe like get 10 points together and locate them on someone in 10 minutes. Uh, if you're doing herb ID where you have to look at an herb sample and write out the name and pinion, you should probably study by looking at your herb samples and writing it down. Don't just flip through your flashcards, actually do the thing that you're gonna be doing on the test. So that's another one, but again, this is all, there's a video over on the YouTube somewhere that's uh, six study tips for acupuncturists. The other thing I'll just say is I kind of have trouble answering these questions because I'll be honest, when it came to those big tests, I didn't really study very much. Like when, when I took first year ends, I don't know if it's still the same way, but when I took first year ends, it's like if you didn't pass, there were really no consequences. You just took it again. And we, you, like, we had multiple sections, so it's not like you passed or failed the entire thing. It's kind of like you could take four sections, and if you failed one section, you only had to retake that one section. So I kind of thought about it like this uh, process of elimination thing where I was just like, I'm gonna see how much I know, and if I fail one or two sections, well, I can just retake, retake those one or two sections and I can concentrate on just those sections and I'll kind of know what kind of questions they're asking and stuff like that. So uh, for year ends, I didn't really study a whole lot for year ends and I somehow did okay. Uh, the same thing happened when I got to boards. People ask me about like, how do you study for boards? And it's like, I'll be honest, I didn't really study that much for boards. Because uh, at first, like, I wasn't sure if I was going to stay in California. So uh, first I took the nationals. And I'm like, I'm in California. The nationals don't apply. So I'll just go and, and take some of these and see how I do. And so like when by the time I got to herbs, I was so sick of these tests. I was like, my studying for the herbs board was I showed up to the testing site half an hour early and flipped through HB Kim. And then when I got to Kale, by the time I was taking Kale, like I'd already pa passed nationals. Like, I don't know if I want to stay in California. I already passed my nationals, so I'll just kind of go and take the Kale and see if I pass or not. Pass by one point, don't do what I did. But kind of where I'm going with that is, I know that there are some people who are like, oh, I need to study for boards. I'm going to take six months and study for 10 hours a day to prepare for boards. And I'm kind of like, what have you been doing for the last four years? Like, theoretically, you should be studying during during school. Like, you learned all this stuff, didn't you? You took tests. Shouldn't you, shouldn't you kind of know what you're doing? And so uh, I guess that's kind of weird and elitist, but maybe what I'm really getting at is, uh, you know, there's a statement in the classics where they're like, the superior practitioner treats what is not yet ill, while the mediocre practitioner treats what is ill already. Or uh, I think the way the Neijing says it is like, the, the superior practitioner treats illness before the symptoms blossom or something like that. And it says that waiting until symptoms appear is like waiting until you're thirsty to begin digging a well. It's like waiting until the war is upon you to begin forging weapons. And so I kind of feel that way about studying. Like theoretically, you should be studying the whole time. Uh, when you go, when you learn the lung channel, you should probably actually like learn the lung channel. When you learn the heart channel, you should learn the heart channel. And so theoretically it's I guess it's like, if you're waiting until the week before uh, year ends to start studying, you're like, wait until you're thirsty to begin digging a well. Hopefully, uh, so maybe that's something like, maybe you can apply that to second year ends where it's like, you know that these tests are coming up, make sure that you're keeping up with that stuff during the semester. Um, and so hopefully you actually know the information by the time you get to year ends and by the time you get to boards. And I think that goes back to that. Um, don't think of it like I have to study to memorize this information. Think of it like this is a skill that I'm trying to develop and that takes time. And so just like if you're lifting weights, you have to approach that very slowly. You can't do it all in a week and do an intense boot camp session. It's better to 
uh, work on it a little bit each day and slowly progress, call it progressive overloads, make it slowly get harder as you get better. And if you do it over time, you'll get comfortable with it. And then that information will stick around much longer. And by the time you get to uh, year ends, you can just flip through stuff. Sorry, I've been ignoring the chat. Um, Boop, 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 boop. Hello there. I'm interested in becoming an acupuncture student. This will be a second career for me. Yeah, that's really common that a lot of people, it's, I feel like it's very unusual, at least when I was in school, for it to be a first career. Uh, most of the students were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and it was a second career. Uh, what do you probably advise for applying admissions and what to expect as a student? Um, I don't know much about the application or admissions process anymore. I, I taught as a school for a while, but I don't know what the application process is like nowadays. I went to school a while ago, so you can probably uh, talk to admissions. Um, maybe this is kind of a, a not nice thing to say, but I think most acupuncture schools are for-profit schools, so um, the bar isn't if you apply, they'll likely let you in, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so I'm not sure there's like a rigorous, like when I applied for undergrad, it was like, oh, you had to write it. It was a very rigorous process and you weren't sure if you were going to get in or not. Whereas when I applied to acupuncture school, they just like called me up and said, hey, you're in. So I'm not sure it's the admissions process is, has the same kind of rigor that a, a normal university would have. Uh, what to expect as a student. Uh, I have a few things on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to... Uh, there's a, a few student things. So if you go to the YouTube, the main page on the YouTube channel, there's some stuff down here. How to study Chinese medicine. So uh, a few things. Here's that six tips uh, for studying acupuncture. Some stuff specifically on herbs. Here's some more. Uh, uh, Thomas Frank is a really good study guy. He And so he has some good videos on how to use flashcards. So that's some of the stuff. Um, the the for That one down there, Chinese medicine is hard. Oh, maybe you can't see. Yeah, Chinese medicine is hard. Um, that kind of goes over what what the curriculum is kind of like and it's a lot of people that are very overwhelmed in their first year so it's a lot about like how to how to manage that um if you also go to podcast.tcmstudy.net it's really it's uh, kind of a gamble going to your browser and typing in po and hoping that the right thing comes up if you go to podcast.tcmstudy.net go to episodes um a lot of these first ones are about uh, what it's like to start a practice, uh, so opening a practice. But there are a few ones about um, where we talk to students about what it's like. And so uh, there's one where we talk to Mallory. She's uh, she's one of the people who does the point location videos and uh, talking to Holly. So that, that's something that you can look at there on the on the podcast that might give you some some stuff you can expect. Uh, never knew that. Always use that mojo. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that thing. I, I think, like, I always thought it was a prayer hands, and then it was like a 10 facts that will blow your mind. Because I, I read BuzzFeed articles about emojis, and it was a... Uh, they were like, oh, it's supposed to be two people doing a high five. I'll start my first semester in two months. My memory's not as sharp as 10 years ago. Uh, any tips? Uh, again, you can look at that video, uh, study tips for acupuncture. I think it's just, just know that if you're starting out one, if you're coming from nursing school, I found that a lot of people think that if you have a background in Western medicine, that makes those students have an advantage that it's easier for them to learn. Cause like they've already done it before. Uh, I think a lot of times it's, it can actually be a disadvantage. It can be a hurdle to get over just because when we're talking about fundamentals, Chinese medicine is so different that you kind of have to erase every the, some of the things that you've learned from medical school. So when we start talking about things like the spleen as a digestive organ or the liver stores blood or the heart and its relationship to the spirit. Sometimes that can be really weird when you come from a Western background that you have to switch to a completely new paradigm with Chinese medicine. And so if we start talking about things like 
like IBS and stuff like that, we actually don't talk about IBS in terms of the large intestine. The large intestine is kind of a dumb organ in Chinese medicine. We would relate that to the spleen. And so you're like, what does the spleen have to do with diarrhea? It makes sense in Chinese medicine. And so that, that's one thing I would say that you have to think of this as a separate paradigm, uh, a separate way of thinking about things. Sometimes I make the analogy between um, Euclidean geometry and non-Euclidean geometry. Like people, a lot of people would look at Euclidean geometry and be like, that's weird. That's wrong. There's no way that could be right. These people are smoking something. But really, they're just two, two different systems that start with different assumptions that Euclidean geometry uh, has the Playfair postulate. It's Euclid's fifth axiom that we reworded as a Playfair postulate. And non-Euclidean geometry just started without that. It took the opposite of the Playfair postulate, this idea that if you have a line and a point not on that line, there's exactly one line parallel to that point. If we take the negation of that, we end up with an entirely different system that looks very different but it's still just as logical and rational. And it's kind of like that with Chinese medicine, that we started out with some different assumptions and that caused us to veer off in different directions. So you have to make sure that you're not trying to apply your Western medicine assumptions to a traditional Chinese system. So that, that would be the big thing. And then just when you start out, it's a lot of memorization. And so just be patient with it. If stuff is really confusing, just stick with it. Uh, one story I tell is I had a a uh, Chinese teacher that he went to school in China during during the period of Mao Zedong. And even for Chinese students in China, when they went to their first year at university, their teachers would, would kind of beg of them, please stick with it. Uh, please be patient. This takes a while to understand. So if you're frustrated now, please, uh, please just be patient and stick with it, and it will eventually make sense. And it's kind of like if Chinese people were telling Chinese that to Chinese students in China, I think that definitely applies to students in the West, that it's just something that it takes some time and you have to be patient with it. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, good, Maxwell. Hi, Maxwell. Yeah, um, the herbs email list, if you want to sign up for that, I put a link in the description below. And it's just kind of a something, I, again, it's something I kind of cobbled together. So it's like... It might be a little bit of a repeat if you've been following the channel for a while. It might be a little, it's kind of just pointing you to some of the different resources. But some of those things, it's like, it's hard to organize everything on one website. So this is just kind of targeting everything. Albert, thanks for being here. Boop, 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 Xander, thanks for being here, Xander. Your videos are super helpful. Thank you. With tons of neat memorization techniques. Um, that's. I feel like I have a weird way of remembering, a weird and inappropriate way of remembering things. So I'm glad that people actually enjoy that. I had the three questions on the 12 meridian clock flow of chi to memorize it. Okay, yeah, and that and that's another thing. Where it's like I try to we do that like in the herb course too. Is like trying to be like here's some questions and here are some walk you through some strategies of how to do it. Uh, memorizing the point categories like the five shoe points. No, I mean, I, I, like I had that video on the five shoe points, and I feel like. We kind of talked about that mnemonic device, most sane families are against insects, because you can't say incest anymore. So most sane families are against insects. And so that gets you part of the way there with the most superficial fire intestines thing. Um, really, this is kind of a thing when people talk about memorization tricks. For me, it's easier to remember things when I understand things. And so I'm trying to make connections to other things and understand them. And so that's why for me, memorizing those categories, it was easier to look at it in terms of the five phases or the five elements. That when we talk about ying spring points belong to the fire phase or the fire element, so they're about clearing heat. We can connect this to herbs. When you talk about the five flavors, Fire corresponds to the bitter flavor, and bitter fla the bitter flavor, bitter herbs, clear heat and drain fire. So we can think bitter belongs to fire, it clears heat, ying spring points are fire, they clear heat, and so making connections that way. And that's kind of what, that's kind of the way I look at it. And then sometimes there's just, there's not really a way to, sometimes there's not a connection to be made, and that's kind of difficult. So I don't know if that was actually helpful. 
Oh, Maxwell is talking about if you don't pass now, you can't enroll in subsequent courses. This is going back to that thing about uh, year ends. And I feel like that, at least when I was in school, that was true eventually. Like, if you failed the first time, you could still enroll in your second semester classes. It's if you failed the second time, then then they stopped you and you couldn't move on. But at least when I was in school, if you failed the first time, it didn't really set you back any. And it, that was true for first year ends. That was not true for second year ends, because really, that really freaked everybody out about second year ends, where in order to be an intern in the clinic, you had to pass your second year ends. And so that's the thing is like the semester before, people were signing up for clinic but then they had to wait for the results of their year-end test before they knew if they could actually be in clinic. So if, they, if you failed your second year-ends, that like messed everything up. And I think after I graduated, they changed that. They, they moved it back a semester or something like that so that uh, second year-ends didn't, like you still had a, a one semester grace period. Um, so I don't know if that's still the case or not. How many board exams do you have to take to get the license? Uh, it depends on where you are. Basically, there's a, a, our certification board is the NCCOM, the National Certification Council for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. And if you become certified in that, you can get a license in, I think, 47 or 48 states. The exceptions are California, Nevada, and possibly something weird like Rhode Island. I feel like there's one more like weird state. Those states have their own tests. So in California, you have to they call it the CALE, the California Acupuncture Licensing Exam. So California has a separate test. Nevada, I think it's something weird uh, where it's like you have to pass, pass the NCCOM, but then you also have to take a special Nevada test. I'm not sure if they were reworking that. Somebody told me something, there was like weird stuff going on with the Nevada Acupuncture Council that it's, they're very closed in and they don't, and they're, they're trying to keep it very closed uh, and in the family or, or something like that. I don't know if that's changed, but that's something that somebody in Nevada told me years ago. And so mostly if you pass uh, nationals, then that's good for most of the states. The thing is national, the NCCOM has four modules. They have foundations, acupuncture, uh, herb, herbology, and uh, biomed, which I think they put ethics in combined with biomed. I'm not sure. It's been a while. But the thing is, not every state requires you to take all four modules. So if you take, if you pass all four of those modules, and I believe you're called like a diploma of acupuncture by the NCCOM, some states require that you take all four in order to get a license. Some states only require you to take one or two. I think there might be some that don't require any, but so it kind of depends on what state you're in. But the we talk about the uh, the board, when we say nationals, we mean the NCCUM board test, and for that there are four modules. Boop, 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 boop. Hi, Nicholas. I'm from India. Hello, from India. Um, let me know where you are. I always be like, like when people say, I'm from China, I'm like, oh yeah, where from? And I actually, oh, my geography is not that good. I know like two places in China. So I, I kind of do the same thing with India. It's like, oh, where from? It's like, if you don't say uh, Delhi or Calcutta, I actually don't know where you're from. Well, you post about the eight extraordinary vessels on uh, YouTube and uh, chronic conditions of excess and deficiency. Um, I don't have a lot on that. So basically, I have an introduction to it when we talk about the secondary channels, and that's just the introduction to when you're taking a points one class. Uh, at least the, the way we, we did it when I was in school in America is you learned the 12 primary channels or the 14 channels with all the points. And then after that, we went into more detail with uh, some of those channels, like how do you treat the low channels, how do you treat the eight extraordinary. Um, so I feel like it might be a while before I would get to something like that. I would I want to I would want to go through the twelve primary channels first. <sighs> I feel like there's a book. Was it is that Mickey Shimo's book? Was that about the eight extraordinary? Boop, 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 boop. I feel like there was a really good because that's the thing is like at least in English there's not a whole lot written about the eight extraordinary vessels. Um, 
And so it's kind of hard for us to say a whole lot. Here we go. Um, if you go to eastlandpress.com, there's this book, An Exposition on the Eight Extraordinary Vessels by Mickey Shima. And I remember when this book first came out, uh, I, I haven't read it, but I remember when this book first came out, I was still in school and a lot of people were really excited about getting this book. And they said, this is a really good book. And it, um, I think it contains things that, like I said, there's not a lot that's been translated into English about the uh, Eight Extraordinary Vessels. So I think he was working off of some stuff that uh, he read in, in Chinese. Oh, Lee Jen's exposition on the Eight Extraordinary. I wonder, is this just a translation? I thought I thought it was a book that he wrote. The Qi Jing Bamai is among some miracle of the Chinese. But yeah, and that's the thing. I think a lot of like, our Lee Jen stuff isn't actually uh, translated into into English. Oh, this is the first translation of and commentary on that exposition. So yeah, it's it's like Lee Shurgen, uh a lot of that stuff hasn't been hasn't been trans or there's not very good translations into English. So this is more like a translation of that exposition with some commentary. So that might be if you're interested in the eight extraordinary vessels, that might be a book to check out. Uh, I I haven't read it, but I've heard good things about it. It might be a, it might be a while before I use the eight before I make a video on it. Another one you could look at is the um, applied channel theory in Chinese medicine by Wang Juyi. I put all my books back on the shelf so I can't just grab, actually it's here, I can't just grab it. Ooh, hope my computer didn't just explode. Um, this does have a chapter or two, Applied Channel Theory in, uh, in Chinese medicine does have some stuff on the eight extraordinary vessels and it, I think it kind of gives an, a good, again, overall explanation of those channels. I'm, there might not be a whole lot specifically in terms of treatment. But I feel like, at least in the West, a lot of people, they don't know very much about them. And so a lot of what they're doing with them is guessing. And I, I don't entirely, it's like I, I know some people that like every, every treatment, they're like, oh, I'm going to throw in an extraordinary vessel point pair. I'm like, eh, maybe you shouldn't treat the extraordinary vessels unless you know that the extraordinary vessels are, are diseased. But a lot of people just kind of use them willy-nilly, so... I don't know. Uh, nice practical posters. I think we talked about this last time where um, I know that Lhasa OMS has some. Uh, and then if you go to like Holism prints. If you go to holismprints.com. Uh, uh, she has some nice posters. So that's another option you can you can try out. Um, other than that, I feel like like uh, some of the textbooks have really good ones. Uh, I feel like Deadman has the best pictures. So even if you wanted to get like the Deadman app, I think the Deadman app is expensive. It's like forty dollars, but people say it's really good. Or Deadman has flashcards that you can get again on Eastland Press. Um, and then I know that some people get the, like, the little statues. I'm not sure if those help. I don't know. I was never into those statues, but I know people would get, like, little statues. And so then you can have a, a, a little naked man sitting on your, on your nightstand, and you can look at the points. Yeah, Albert saying, I bought the manual of acupuncture by uh, Peter Dedman and uh, Mazin al -Kafaji. And so that book has really good pictures. He also has... a uh, there's also like a flashcard version of it's it's like a big card deck and it has it has really good pictures and i think they also have uh an app what else would you recommend i don't know i feel i feel like that's the definitive one somebody actually just made a website i'll have to look at it cuz i feel like they were a master tongue person but somebody just made a a website where it was a very long process where they were um Basically, it was a description of the points, but the, like the it was it wasn't illustrations. It was very well done. Where it's like they would take a picture of the body part, and then over it they would draw in the bones, and then so it's like you could see 
In one picture, you could see where it was on a real person, where it was on their body, but you could also see the anatomical structures and... I don't remember what that website is called, but I remember when that came out and it looked really cool, and so I'll try to look into that. Boop, boop, boop. Can you go over the six levels kind of briefly in relation to herbs? And that's kind of the thing is like I was going to make a video about this at some point that kind of like the six levels in herbs and acupuncture are slightly different. Whereas like in er in acupuncture, well, let me put it this way. In herbs, when you're studying the Shang Han Lun, the order of the six channels is Tai Yang Yang Ming Xiao Yang, Tai Yin Xiao Yin Jue Yin. In acupuncture and in the Neijing, and when you read something like Applied Channel Theory by Wang Juyi, it's Tai Yang Xiao Yang Yang Ming, Tai Yin Xiao Yin Jue Yin. And when you read Machiocha's, so the first two are flipped, but when you read Machiocha's uh, orange book, he lists the order of the channels as Tai Yang Xiao Yang Yang Ming, Tai Yin Jue Yin Xiao Yin. So he flips the last two. Why does he do that? Uh, for a long time, I never knew, and I thought it was kind of silly. And then I uh, eventually uh, I found a blog post where he wrote about, like, even though it literally says this in the Neijing, I interpret it this other way. So he flips the two, and then he gives his arguments as to why he does that. And I don't think they're very good arguments. So it's kind of it's kind of weird. Uh, six levels. If you're talking about it in relation to, in relation to herbs, when you talk about the six levels, really what we're saying is this is the order in which cold pathogens penetrate through the six levels. And so they penetrate through in the order Tai Yang Yang Ming Xiao Yang, Tai Yin Xiao Yin Jue Yin. And so you can think about like a cold pathogen attacking from the outside and slowly working its way in through those six channels. And basically because of the nature of those six channels and because of the pathways of those six channels, we'll experience different symptoms as that pathogen moves through uh, those levels. So the Tai Yang is the most exterior. So when, you, when that cold gets in the Tai Yang level, you get simultaneous fever and chills because we're trying to uh, fight off the pathogen. You may get sweating or no sweating depending on uh, what's happening on the exterior, but it's also you might feel heavy neck and shoulders because that's where the Tai Yang channel goes. UBSI goes to the back of the shoulders and the back of the neck, so you get that neck stiffness, shoulder pain. If it goes in deeper, it can uh, get into the Yang Ming, and this is an internal excess condition, so we get the four bigs, big fever, big thirst, blah, 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 and it kind of depends on whether it's an organ or a channel. I guess, I guess kind of the, the thing is here, no, it's very hard to go over this very briefly. Um, I'm trying to think of where I've talked about this before because I know I go over it in some of the herb videos. I know I go over it in some of the review courses, and I'm not entirely sure if that's available. Um, outside of the course, I don't remember where I put it. So if you go to Intro to Herbs, um, boop, boop, ba -doo, there is a handout on the Shang Han Lun One Bing. This just goes over the first three because that's kind of what we learned. And uh, it has this, on the first day of cold damage, Tai Yang is affected and the signs include headache and pain in the neck and stiffness in the low back because that's where the Tai Yang channel goes. And so here we'll talk about, you have ta the first level is Tai Yang, you have excess and deficiency, the second level is Yang Ming, you have channel and bowel. So sometimes in the case of herbs, if you go to this introduction to herbology section, it has some of this. When we talk, when you start talking about herbs that release the exterior, it goes into that tie. I can't remember if I have anything on the website or on the YouTube channel where I talked about that. Because I know that in the, in the formula review course, I made a separate thing. Like if you're learning formulas, um, I made a thing where I go through and talk about each of the six levels and the different possibilities and the formulas that are associated with each of the six levels. I don't remember if that is on, on the YouTube channel. You might have to, oh, here, Shang Han Lun formulas. I still haven't deleted that video. I think I did this as a live stream and my plan was to upload it to the formula review course and then um, delete it from here. But 
Uh, if you go uh, formula review, Shanghan Moon formulas, that will talk about the six levels. If you're not in formula class, that might be confusing because we're going, we're mentioning formulas, but we're still going to mention the signs and symptoms associated with each of them. So maybe go look at that. Uh, go to the, when you go to the channel, go to the live section where all the live streams are and all these thumbnails look the same, but look for the one that says uh, Shanghan Moon formulas. I think that's all there is there. Boom. Exactly, I'm in Nevada. Hmm. Yeah, somebody, yeah, somebody, I knew some people from Nevada and they were trying to, they, they, they kind of said that the, the Nevada board is, is kind of like a, I'm not sure if they use the word mafia, but they said it's a, it's like a, it's a very closed thing. And we go, when you go and look, there are not a lot of acupuncturists in Nevada. It's like somebody got our license. It's like in California, my license was like AC one seven one six zero five. I should know it, but it's a. Uh, but it was like in the several thousand. Whereas my friend got one, and she was her her, acu, her license number was like a hundred and two. I'm like, there are only a hundred and one other acupuncturists. Boo -boo -boo. Studying, uh, hi Laura, studying in the UK at the moment, wanted to do some multi-bed practice abroad. Do you have any recommendations? I mean, it sounds like you're looking for like an, like an exchange program or something like that. I actually, I, and also I guess like where are you wanting to do it? Um, I don't know. I Like if you're like coming to the US, it gets kind of weird in terms of uh, how how do credits transfer and things like that? I know in the U.S. some of our schools uh, would do trips to China. Um, some of that, it's like when I was in school, it was just like we had Chinese professors who would take people to China for a couple weeks and kind of do a thing with, if they went to Beijing, they would go to the University of Beijing. If they went to Nanjing, they'd go to the University of Nanjing. And so there were programs in China, but it's kind of like we worked that out through our teachers who came from that school. And then I know there are some schools that, as part of their doctoral program, they work that into the um, work that into it. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a lot of information on that. Sorry about that. Uh, four modules in one exam? No. So this is talking about nationals. We have uh, four different modules in um, nationals, and they're all separate. And so that's kind of nice that like when you take the California exam, it's all the topics are mixed together. So the first question might be on herbs. The second question might be on safety. The third question might be acupuncture point location. It's all mixed in. Whereas when you take the NCCM test, it's all separated out. So there's one test on herbs. There's one test on acupuncture. There's one test on biomedicine. And that means you can study for them separately. But that also means you have to pay for them separately. It turns out getting licensed in acupuncture is really expensive, that you first have to pay to apply to take the test, and then you have to pay for each individual test. So I think it ends up being like $2,000 to to get your exam. I have a difficult time differentiating categories like downward draining herbs, herbs that drain dampness, herbs that dispel wind dampness, and aromatic herbs that transform dampness. Yeah, that's that's really confusing. And I feel like when you get to formulas, they kind of throw it all together. It's like herbs that like formulas that treat dampness, and it actually means all of those separate things. Uh, yeah, so this is one that you would want to when you go through it, look at your textbook and, and really read like the first couple pages of each category and that will kind of explain what's going on. Bensky is okay with that. There are some other books that are a lot better with that. If you have um, the Concise Materia Medica by Wiseman and Brand, if you can tolerate Wiseman terminology, he does a really good job of explaining concepts. Uh, but basically, downward draining herbs is a little bit confusing because down, like downward draining and drain dampness sound very similar, but downward draining has nothing to do with dampness. Downward draining means you're pushing things out through the large intestine. Downward draining herbs are basically laxatives. They are herbs that free the stool. I, oh, there's always a glare on this. That's, that's one of the things when we say like, uh, uh, huo ma ren, one of the actions is freeze the stool. In, in Chinese, they say tong bian. 
we got tong, first tone, and bien, fourth tone. So tong means like a free flow, un unobstructed, uh, like a butong se tong, tong se butong. So free the stool so that the stool is not bound up. It can slide uh, harmoniously through the large intestine. So when we say downward draining herbs, we actually mean like laxatives, things that make you poop. That could be either to clear heat or that could be to treat constipation. Herbs that drain dampness, when we here when we say drain dampness, we mean promote urination. So we're not just, like we have another one that's um, uh, herbs that treat damp heat. Uh, herbs that clear heat and dry dampness, those herbs use the bitter flavor to dry up the dampness. We say herbs that drain dampness, we're not just drying up the dampness, we're actually promoting urination. So here, that's where it gets confusing. When we say herbs that drain dampness, means we're promoting urination. When we say downward draining, means we're um, promoting movement through the bowels. I was trying to think of the, the posterior version of urination. We're promoting movement through the bowels. So herbs that drain dampness, we're promoting urination to get rid of the dampness. And this actually has two categories. That one is like a f maybe three category, three subcategories. One is about treating edema and water accumulation where you're accumulating water and you get puffy. The other is about treating UTI-like symptoms where you have a damp heat pathogen blocking the smooth flow of urine. But herbs that drain dampness, we're talking more about promoting urination. Herbs that dispel wind dampness, we're talking about syndrome. So here, when, when they say wind dampness, we're talking about an external pathogen. We're not talking about internally generated dampness, like you ate a bunch of pizza and drank a bunch of beer and now you got the dampness. We're talking about dampness of the, of the environment, uh, attacking the body from the outside and lodging itself in the channels and the muscles and the flesh. So, so when they say herbs that dispel wind dampness, we're talking about B syndrome, like joint pain. So herbs that dispel wind dampness, are like treating arthritis. So that's a wind damp pathogen in the channels. Aromatic herbs that transform dampness, there we're talking about um, internal dampness specifically related to the spleen. Now, the spleen has a function of transforming dampness. So we say aromatic transform dampness. All of those herbs go to the spleen and stomach channels. Those herbs have an action of awakening the spleen so that it can perform its function of transforming dampness. So these aren't necessarily promoting urination or drying it up there. They're helping out the spleen perform its action of transforming dampness. So yeah, those are really weird. Hopefully that uh, made sense. Uh, apps. There's one called the Meridian from Verde Root, where it shows the external internal branches of the twelve primary channels and the three D model. Oh, that's really cool. Um, I'll have to check that out. I haven't heard of I haven't heard of that, but that sounds like it would like like we should be going in that direction where every like we went from like weird looking charts uh, that that kind of look like cave drawings. The, now we have better pictures, so it would be good. Boop, 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 boop. Um, let me let me go back to some of the. I had a couple Instagram questions. Let's go there. Oh, geez, forty-five minutes. I was trying to keep this under an hour. So, uh, first year study tips for comps. Study. Come on. Teach us auricular and small acupuncture, please. Um. I'm actually not sure what small acupuncture means. If anybody knows what that means, uh, type in the chat. I don't know what small acupuncture means. Auricular, yeah, auricular is good to know if you're studying for boards. Um, I've, I've heard people say that, that, that that's something that comes, actually I remember that coming up on nationals when I took nationals, and I've heard people saying that lately that um, you do need to know auricular and you need to know scalp. And I heard somebody say that for scalp, you need to know the functions more than the location. And for auricular, you need to know the location more than the function. And so I, I, I kind of remember that where they're like, where is this point located? Is it located near the tragus or near the, the other notchy thing? Um, I don't really know much about auricular. I was never a big fan of auricular. I feel like this is one of those things where People will do will gravitate towards things that either got good results for them, like they had it done on themselves and they really liked it, or they saw it done on patients, but usually it's like they did it on themselves and now they really like that and different people gravitate towards different things. 
So some people, they got cupping done on themselves and they really liked it, it really helped, and now they do cupping on all their patients. Or uh, I had one Chinese teacher that she would e-stim everybody. Like usually when, when people do e-stim, it's like for musculoskeletal things and they e-stim the local area, like, oh, I got frozen shoulder, let me e-stim your shoulder. This woman would e-stim everything. If you had spleen deficiency, she she would e-stim. And she did stuff that was far apart too. She would like e-stim stomach 36 to LI4. And I thought it, she, would, she would just do a lot of e-stim. And then some people are... Um, some people are really into Twina, they do a lot of Twina. Some people are really into crystals and essential oils because that worked for them, so they do it on their patients. And some people are really into auricular. And I was just never very into auricular. It just never made sense to me. Um, if you do it and you find that it works, that's great. Uh, but I just, it never made sense to me. Um, to me, using the regular channels just made a lot more sense. I think if you go to uh, earseeds.com, oh, Earseeds Academy. Um, if you look up earseeds, uh, I think these are people who make earseeds in the U.S. And they make a lot of different types of earseeds. They make the regular vicaria seeds, but they also make the metal seeds, the gold seeds. Um, but I think if you go there, they also have some they might have some classes and stuff like I feel like they have free seminars because they're trying to sell their ear seeds so they have a lot of webinars on how to use the ear seeds and so they probably have some charts and classes and stuff like that and they might be um, I guess they are for sale I, I thought for a while some of them were just free because they were trying to get you to buy their products um, so that's where it they're in the business of auricular, so I would go there if you want to learn auricular. They might have some free charts or stuff, but I'm, I'm not really into auricular. Sorry. And then um, Accuvated Wellness Center says, How did you remember all these herb names for preparing for the boards? Uh, yeah, and this is a question I get a lot about remembering the pinion names for herbs. And so I feel like for some people... It's easier for them to remember the pinion, but they have a hard time remembering the Latin. And for some people, it's the other way around. They have an easy time remembering the Latin botanical name, but it's hard for them to remember the pinion. I was one of those people where it was much easier to remember the Chinese. But anyway, um, um, so for me, like I said, memorizing things, it's a lot easier to memorize things when I understand what they mean. And so in terms of knowing the pinion, for me, knowing the, uh, like, if there's a translation of the name, that really helped. And so usually one way I tell people to, to start off with this is uh, easy Chinese to learn in terms of herbs is learn the names of the colors and the names of the plant parts. And so I would usually do that in my intro class where you go here, is in this one, part two? I got some notes. No, not this one. Is it this one, part one? Lecture slides, basic properties of herbs? It's in one of these. So, so at the bottom of the very last part of that, we have common Chinese. So here is the name of the plant parts, and those come up a lot. So yi means leaf, zhi means twig, like gui zhi, cinnamon twig, hua means flower. And then you have the colors, like Qing means, it can mean blue or green or purple. It's actually kind of a weird thing. Um, Hong means, Hong and Chu both mean red. Anyway, these colors come up a lot. And it turns out you can actually put them together a lot. So sometimes, like we have an herb called Hong Hua. Hong means red, Hua means flower. Hong Hua means red flower. It's safflower. Um, zi cao, zi means purple, sao means herb, zi cao means purple herb. Uh, qing pi, qing means green, pi means peel, qing pi is green peel, it's um, unripe tangerine peel. And, and so if you know just the colors and the plant parts, that can get you a good way there. Also, um, I was actually like, I was... I tried to record some like little TikTok short videos about how the name of an herb is sometimes related to its function. And so sometimes that's true where the name of an herb is either something kind of funny or is sometimes even related to its function. So if you're studying through your herbs 
uh, in Bensky, there's a, a section where it says nomenclature and preparation, and we'll actually talk about what the the Chinese translation of that name. And sometimes that's sometimes that's helpful, and sometimes it's not. So you have things like um, some of the one some of the fun things are like Wang Bu Liu Xing, uh, the carrier seed. Uh, Wang Bu Liu Xing. Wang means king. Xing means to move or to walk. So Wang Bu Liu Xing means even the king cannot stop it from walking, or even the king cannot stop it from moving. And kind of the idea here is, if you were like out on the street walking, and the king came by, you would have to stop and bow to the king. But with Wang Bu Liu Xing, it has such a moving property that even if the king shows up, it won't stop. It will just keep moving because it, because it's so strongly moving. And Wang Bu Liu Xing is for invigorating blood, and so that the name of the herb is related to its function of invigorating blood. Or Niu Shi means ox knees. It invigorates blood, but it also tonifies liver and kidney to strengthen tendon and bone. So if you take Niu Shi, your knees will be as strong as an ox. So some of them. Have fun stories like that. Um, some of them, if you just look at them long enough, you 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 might see patterns like um, uh, the word for mulberry is song. So we have song ye mulberry leaf, song jur mulberry twig, song shen mulberry root, song ji sheng is mulberry parasite. It's mistletoe. It's a a parasitic plant that grows on mulberry trees. Um, jiang means ginger, so shengjiang is fresh ginger, ganjiang is dry ginger, jiang huang is yellow ginger or turmeric, um, galiangjiang is a, a different type of ginger, a uh, galangal root. And so sometimes you see things like that. Sometimes the, the, the names are just kind of, they have a translation, but they don't mean very much. Like Chai Hu is barbarian kindling, or something like that, or um, things like that. So, oh yeah, uh, oh, uh, what does your shirt? So the the shirt. This is a um, this is a shirt I made. It's on the website. It, it's probably showing up down below. This is the character for Dao, like Taoism, and then it says this is the way. That's a reference to the Mandalorian, and so that's I, I have my my baby Yoda out too, my Grogu, excuse me, my Grogu out here too. Um, so it's kind of a joke about Star Wars and Taoism. Uh, so this is the the character Dao for the way, and then it says this is the way. And also the first line of the Dao Jing is Dao ke Dao Fei Chong Dao, Ming ke Ming Fei Chong Ming. Uh, the Dao the Dao that can be Dao is not the true Dao, or the way that can be followed is not the true way. So it's also kind of a joke where it's like this is the way, but it's like uh, but it's like it's not the true way according to anyway. It's a Taoism joke. So those are available on the website. Um. Where would that be? If you go up here to resources, uh, merchandise, it only has the three on there, but if you click on it, it takes you to the Teespring store, and I actually uh, had some new stuff made, if it actually loads. And so uh, there there should be two, ver there's two versions of that. One is more colorful, one is more, one is this one. Um, there's the, the free the stool mug. It's glaring. You can't see that. There's a free the stool mug, um, and then I, I, don't know, I like this. The acupuncture is magical, but also kind of stabby. I also made it into a mug, and uh, I left this, and my cat tipped over. My cat knocked over my mug, and so I have a broken acupuncture is magical mug. If you're into unicorns, I got a graphic designer to make me some unicorns. So that's the shirt. You can get those online if you want to. That's another way you can support the channel, the website. Is buy a t-shirt. Told myself I was never going to do that. But then I went and did it. Boop, boop, ba -doo. What's the difference between a channel and a vessel? So channel is Jing, vessel is my, um, and this is one of those things where it gets confusing because 
we have a lot of terms in Chinese that can mean different things depending on the context. So like when we say qi, we can mean energy, but qi can also mean the air that you breathe in. When we say essence, that can mean some uh, really undefined substance that's your life force in your kidneys, but jing, essence, can also mean semen. So it kind of depends on what we're talking about. So my vessel can mean something, sometimes it means something similar to the channels, just maybe at a deeper level. My can also mean vessel as in the blood vessels. And it turns out that that same term my can also mean pulse. So when we talk about the, the pulses, we might say like the uh, a floating pulse is fu mai, and that's the same that's the same my as in vessel, so it's a little bit it's a little bit confusing. Um, I'm also like I wouldn't worry about it too much. Boop boop boo. Hello, Yana in Israel. Thanks for watching the videos. That's cool. Any any tips for passing the acupuncture board? It's been a while since I've taken boards, so I don't exactly know what's on those tests. Um, mostly trick questions and obscure topics. I remember being real frustrated about that because they, sometimes they would give you a case study and then they just give you a list of points. And sometimes they would give you a list of points and there were only one or two points that were different. And I was kind of like... Really, you could make a justification for any of these, but it was really frustrating because they were looking specifically for the list of points that came from Machiocha. They were looking specifically for the list of points that came from Cam. Or I think at one point, Bensky wrote an acupuncture book that I never read and never wanted to read, and so they were pulling stuff out of that. So I remember that being really frustrating. Um, so I don't know. Uh, but apparently there is uh, there is some scalp stuff and some auricular stuff, so make sure you go over that. I do remember there being, at least when I took it, and this was like 10 or 12 years ago at this point, uh, there were, there was some location stuff, and it was kind of interesting. They would give you a picture, and then there were like three different dots. It's like, this is the TCM location of the point, this is the five-element location of the point, and this is the Japanese location of the point. And so, uh, I don't know, it was weird. Oh yeah, what I find frustrating about the Deadman is he's ex he's explaining points where points are located in relation to the anatomical landmark. And yeah, that I think that is something you have to know just because um, that's going to show up on tests and that's just how we talk about the points. And a lot of times we'll have anatomy and physiology classes and part of the reason we do that is so that you know those anatomical landmarks. Um, that we're referencing for the points. And like I sometimes I tell the story that my first midterm in, in points, uh, I got a question that was like, LI11 is located between the blank blank and the blank blank of the blank. I'm like, that's way too many blanks. So first of all, I was frustrated that because like it was way too many blanks. And second of all, it was like I knew where LI11 was, but I wasn't sure what was supposed to go in those blanks. It, you just had to memorize the word for word definition. And so it's like LI11 is located min midway between the biceps brachii tendon and the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So it's like you can't just be like LI11 is right there. You do actually have to know the anatomical landmarks in order to find it. And that's just that's part of learning Chinese medicine. Oh, nice. Um, we got the we got the robots in here. New adult t dating. So that's nice that I'm I'm now big enough that I've attracted the sex robots on my YouTube channel. Boop, boop, ba -doo. I'm nearly complete with herbs for formulas. What to expect in the next two? Um, basically, yeah, so it's basically like herbs one, two, three is your single herbs, and then herbs four, five, six are your formulas. And it kind of follows a very similar pattern. Like in herbs one, you started out with herbs that release the exterior. In, in herbs four, the first formulas class, you start out with formulas that release the exterior. And and it kind of goes through on along in a very similar progression. So you have herbs that tonify and then you have formulas that tonify. So it's a very 
it's a very similar uh, progression. And so one thing I would recommend, I'm not sure if anybody actually does this, but one thing I would recommend is if you know a, a category is coming up, go back and review your single herbs because on the one hand, a lot of the, the TCM theory is going to overlap. Uh, so if you're going to, if you're starting herbs for and you're studying formulas that release the exterior, go back and review herbs that release the exterior from your herbs one class because the signs and symptoms for releasing the exterior are going to be the same. And then a lot of the herbs from your single herb category are going to show up in those formulas. So you might as well review the single herbs. So that's what I do. Uh, um, that's what I'd recommend with that. And then, but then it's just... Um, Um, sorry, I'm looking at my, I have the sex robots again, but it's kind of like you're just going through all the formulas again and, um, I, um, I do have a formula review course, the review courses, formulas, and Basically, this was meant to be, a lot of people use this for studying for boards. It was originally meant to be a, a study guide for second year ends because you don't need to know all the formulas that you learn in, in class aren't going to show up on your second year ends. There's a specific list of formulas that you need to know. And it turns out that list of formulas you need to know is the same as the list of the NCCM formulas that you need to know. And so this would be another another possibility that this was meant that for second year ends, but you could also use it to review for finals and things like that. So it's something that you could go back and review some of these things. So maybe if you're if you it's divided up as if you were taking herbs four, five, and six. So maybe when you get into herbs five, you're going to start out with formulas that dispel summer heat. There's only one formula, Leo Isan. And then you'll move on to formulas that warm the interior. And so maybe this is something that you could use adjunctively with that, that maybe first you could go back and um, before you get to the, the class, you could go back and review the category herbs that warm the interior because a lot of the signs and symptoms are the same, a lot of those same similar herbs that are coming up. So before you go to that lecture, review your single herb. And then after you go, after you're done with the lecture, um, you can go and review that there where it will go through it will go through the main formulas of formulas that warm the interior. So that's a way you can kind of like double side review it is you could preview the category by looking at the single herbs and then you could review the category by looking at the form. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense now. I'm just kind of rambling at this point. It's we're getting to the hour mark, so I think we need to we need to stop soon. Or did I have any uh, any other? I think those were all of my those are all of my Instagram questions. Oh, geez, Patrick, what's the difference between acupuncture and dry needling? Oh, I'm not sure we should get into that at this hour. Dry needling is some Western guy reinvented acupuncture. He reinvented orthopedic acupuncture. So if you have someone who's a licensed acupuncturist, that, that means they went to school for like three or four years and they studied an entire system of traditional Chinese medicine, which includes, um, which, in, which includes all the theory, all the traditional theory of how the channels flow, how uh, the five phases and everything like that. When you talk about dry needling, uh, if somebody does dry needling, likely they went to a weekend course. It's a chiropractor or a physical therapist who went to a weekend course as opposed to a four-year school. And they needle trigger points in muscles. Um, so... Um, it's kind of like they're like number one, they're focused on musculoskeletal conditions. So if you follow a theory of traditional Chinese medicine, that was their system of medicine. You, you, we could treat elbow pain, we could treat like tennis elbow or inability to comb your hair or inability to draw a bow is what they said in the 1100s. We could treat things like tennis elbow, knee pain, sciatica, but we can also treat things like anxiety, insomnia, digestive issues, 
uh, women's health issues, stuff like that, reproductive uh, fertility, painful periods, stuff like that. All of that falls under the category of Chinese medicine, and you can all of those can be treated with acupuncture. When we talk about dry needling, we're specifically talking about musculoskeletal complaints like my hip hurts, so I'm going to stick some needles in your hip to activate the trigger trigger points. I believe the style is, is a little bit different too. Uh, I actually haven't ever gone to dry needling or know much about it, but what I've heard from people is that Usually when, when we do an acupuncture treatment, we pick a, a series of points all over the body, we stick those points in, and then we leave the needles in. We retain the needles and leave them in anywhere from like 15 minutes to 28 minutes or longer. And so uh, that's very common in acupuncture Chinese medicine. You would retain the needles. Um, I believe in dry needling, they don't retain the needles, but they do heavy manipulation of the needles. So it's like if you got... If you got sciatica or piriformis syndrome, they'll they'll take a needle, stick it in your butt, and really go at it, and then pull the needle out, and you're done. Um. So some people really like it. Um, some people are really against it. Uh, this is kind of a contentious topic where a lot of a lot of acupuncturists will say that dry needling should be illegal, that you need to have an acupuncture license to do acupuncture. These people are basically practicing acupuncture without a license. And I think there's some validity to that. And it's especially funny because a lot of the people who do dry needling are chiropractors, and chiropractors are very protective of their scope of practice. Well, it's like like we have a style of tui na called jungu tui na, which includes bone setting, and chiropractors sued people because they, they said, oh, you're practicing chiropractic without a license. And so it, it's kind of like if you're a massage therapist, you have, you, it's like if you're pressing on someone's back and their bone cracks, like suddenly a chiropractor will pop up and, and try to sue you. Uh, but now they're being like, oh, I'm going to take a weekend dry needling course and buy some acupuncture needles and start stabbing people with acupuncture needles. And they have no problem that that's not actually in their scope of practice. So that's one thing. Um, I've known some, it's also frustrating because a lot of times with dry needling, uh, people don't know the difference. And so sometimes people will share stuff on Facebook where it's like, oh, somebody had a pneumothorax when they got acupuncture. Acupuncture is dangerous. They got this infection or, or something like that. I knew someone who went to dry needling and they had a seizure on the tail. Anyway, but people will share it and they say an acupuncturist did this. And when you go and read the article, it wasn't actually an acupuncturist. It wasn't a licensed acupuncturist who went to a school of traditional Chinese medicine. It was somebody doing dry needling. And it turns out most people don't know the difference. And so that kind of gives us a, a, bad, uh, a bad rap that they think, oh, acupuncture, an acupuncturist uh, collapsed this person's lung. Like, no, it was a chiropractor. Or it was a it was a physical therapist who took a weekend course, not a licensed acupuncturist. So that's that's one of the reasons people get upset about it. I don't know. I feel I almost have this weird opinion that, like, I've been volunteering with veterans lately, and I met a while ago. I met this woman that she said she does dry needling at the VA, and so on the one hand, I uh, on a on a philosophical level, I disagree with that, but it's kind of like. She has veterans who are coming in with really bad headaches. She sticks needles in their neck and their headaches go away. It's like, why, how should I? I don't want to argue with that because it's like these, the people who are coming into the VA, they probably wouldn't have gone to an acupuncturist. It's likely that their benefits don't cover acupuncture, so they couldn't have gone to an acupuncturist. So the fact that this person is there is using a technique that gets these people out of pain, I feel like that's a good thing and um, they should be able to do that. And I almost kind of feel like there is a difference between uh, acupuncture and dry needling, but I feel like as acupuncturists, it's up to us to inform our patients about the difference between that. And that could actually be a marketing thing that you can say as an acupuncturist, as a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. I think that's the other thing is like for a long time, people have been calling themselves acupuncturists, and that is not an accurate description of what we do. We are doctors of Chinese medicine. So you can say as a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, these are the things that I can do, and these are the kinds of things I can treat. And that's very different from going to a physical therapist who does dry needling. And I think it's as acupuncturists, it's up to, it's up to us to do it. Um, please don't needle yourself. 
unless you're in school or under supervision. Um, and so I, I think it's still the case, like if you go onto LASA and you want to order needles, you have to give them a, a license. Only licensed acupuncturists can buy acupuncture needles. So I'd say don't, please don't try that on yourself. And that's kind of one of the reasons I don't like making acupuncture location videos is I don't want people going home and trying acupuncture on themselves. You should go to an acupuncturist or you should, you should be supervised by a licensed acupuncturist. I think if you're, if you don't have training, you have you certainly have no business sticking needles in people. I would say it's not a good idea to be sticking needles in yourself um, without training. But then again, I, I suppose some people give give themselves tattoos, and that's that's weird. Boo, boo, boo. I think we're getting to the end. I think I'm running out of I'm running out of steam. So uh, I wanted to call it an hour. So um, let's just say I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for coming here. I'm glad everybody enjoys the videos. Again, uh, there's an herb review course. If you want to, uh, sign up for that, that's a, a free email course. You can sign up for that if you're reviewing for your first year end boards. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports the channel, the website, the, uh, everything we do here. A uh, special thank you to the Patreon members. That's what, if you want to support the channel, that's one of the best ways you can do it is by joining a Patreon. Uh, there may or may not be a link down below, uh, but basically joining the Patreon, that's like a monthly, uh, a monthly pledge that supports us. And lately I've, I have been trying to put extra stuff on the Patreon page. I never know what kind of extras people would want to get for subscribing to the Patreon, but lately I've been putting extra stuff where like, here's a recipe for lamb stew. It's getting cold outside. So lamb is one of the warming thing, uh, most warming meats and it also include some other warming herbs like cinnamon and ginger and turmeric, jiang huang. Uh, an explanation of a pumpkin spice, pumpkin pie spice, like all those spices actually come from the warmly interior category. So there's something on that. And then just some fun facts about like the difference between a, um, a, what is a rough or choppy pulse when we say it's like a silkworm munching on a mulberry leaf, what does that mean? Or when, uh, you can use 2BA Chong to promote lactation. There's some. There's a few extra videos that I did as like tutoring videos. Um, so there are a few extra videos on there. So if you want to support the site, that's one way is you can join the Patreon. Uh, another way you can do it is nowadays underneath each video, there's a super thanks button. Or if you're here live, there's a super chat or super sticker button. That's another way you can just donate money to the channel through YouTube. And then if you don't, I know not everyone has funds to support the channel, so just uh, liking, subscribing, sharing, and all that good stuff is a way to support the channel. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, tomorrow, I was going to do a, a small webinar on the basics of pulse diagnosis. So how we can evaluate the pulse using the letters RDSQ, rate, depth rate, strength, depth, and quality, and then also what kind of diagnostic information do we get by evaluating it that way. So uh, tomorrow, same time, we're going to be doing a, a, a review on, or a beginner's guide to pulse diagnosis. So if you're here for tomorrow, look for that. Thank you for being here. Oh, and we probably won't do this next, uh, next, next week. Uh, I, I wanted to restart doing this every Friday. Next next Thursday is American Thanksgiving. So I think most people will be out. I will be at home visiting my family. So we're probably not going to do it next week. Hopefully we can pick up the week after. I may or may not be teaching a chainsaw class in Florida. I'm leaning towards not. So we might pick it up the next week. So thanks for being here. We'll do it again. We'll see you in the next one. They should have made like a live, they're making live action everything. They should make a live action Captain Planet. That would be weird. Alright, thank you for being here. 
we'll see you on the next one. Have a good weekend.